Hey, you are listening to Sean of the South. I'm your host tonight, Sean Dietrich, and we're coming to you live in the podcast airwaves and the radios all over this fine country. That music you're fixing to hear behind me is the Quasi Brothers, everybody. The Quasi Brothers. Quasi Brothers, everybody. Quasi Brothers. That was Big John McNeil, the Quasi Brothers from Kansas City. And now this next tune is going to be Patty on the Turnpike. Give it up for the Quasi Brothers, everybody.
We're going to read a little bit of our mail tonight, a little bit of our mail sent in to us from listeners all over the nation who had a little better to do and to sit down and send us a message straight from the heart. First message comes from listener Meredith Ratton in Birmingham, Alabama. Hi, Sean. I just wanted to give you a shout out. I just wanted to give my son Michael a shout out, that is. He's away at Auburn at college. We miss him. We miss him every day. I've got my famous chicken pot pie on the table for when he returns this weekend when he comes to visit us. Come back home soon, Michael. We are waiting for you. Dear Meredith, please save a spot on the table for me. I love chicken pot pie. Ornie Williams, Caramel, Indiana. Just wanted to tell you about my father, Sean. He's a retired Navy guy, and he's the strongest man that I know. But he is very, very scared of spiders. And I saw him just last week backed up into a corner of his living room. He was having himself a nervous breakdown. He begged me to kill this spider, and I went all around looking for it throughout the house, but I could not find it. And when I finally found the spider he was talking about, I had to laugh, because that thing was so small, I could hardly even see it. Besides, it was just a daddy long legs, and daddy long legs don't do no harm to nobody. I rolled up a newspaper, and I tried to get it, but I missed it. So I had to lie to my father. I told him I killed it, and he didn't believe me. He asked to see the evidence. So I just pretended to flush it down the toilet real quick, wrapped it up in a Kleenex. My father, Mr. Tough Guy, he's a big old wimp. I've got him listening to your show. Just wanted to tell you that story because you're always asking for funny stories. That's all I got. (laughs) Dear Oni, thank you very much. That might be the funniest one tonight. Alma Ramirez, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Sean, I enjoy your show each week, and I'm sending this message out to my nine-year-old niece, Blanca. She lives in Hot Springs, Arkansas, and she listens to your show faithfully. She wants to be a veterinarian when she grows up. I hope she doesn't change her mind because she loves animals and she would make a great animal doctor. Dear Alma, the world is in trouble if nine-year-olds are listening to my show on purpose. From everybody here tonight, happy ninth birthday to Blanca in Hot Springs. (laughs) Philip Supfold, Alfreda, Georgia. Sean, my mom had so many jokes memorized, it was insane. She could tell stories about this and that and the other, and she could make you laugh. Oh, she could make you laugh, and I wish she were here with me sometimes because days get lonely in this big old house where I live, which was the same house she raised me in. I still sleep in the same room that I slept in when I was a baby. But now I live here with my family, and I sleep in that room with my wife, and my mama lives in heaven. I was just going to tell you I miss her spirit, I miss her stories, and I miss her jokes because they were the best, and she always made me feel like life was never as bad as we make it out to be sometimes. I don't know if people in heaven could hear you, but would you wish my mother peace? Dear Phil, you got it, brother. Dear Philip's mother, may you have peace wherever you are. Beck Wyndham, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Sean saw an advertisement for free puppies on the side of the road. It was a sign made of poster board written in Sharpie marker. And I really, really did not want to stop because I don't have room in my life for a dog, even though my kids don't believe that. But, but, these puppies were St. Bernard puppies, and I don't know if you've ever seen a St. Bernard puppy, but they are the cutest things you have ever seen in your life. When we got there, the mother dog was chewing on a toy. When I got closer, I could see that it was no toy at all. It was a brick. <laughs> this dog had jaws that were big enough to chew a brick in half. I told my son, no, no, and no, absolutely not. We are not going to have a puppy whose mother chews bricks for fun. 
We cannot afford a puppy. We do not need a puppy, especially one that gets this big. That was three years ago, Sean. And since then, that dog has chewed up every piece of molding and trim in our house and run every stitch of carpet on our floors. <laughs> He's a St. Bernard, and we call him St. Peter. <laughs> And we would not trade him for anything in the world. Anyhow, you write and you talk about dogs a lot. I thought I'd tell you about ours. Dear Beck, thank you very much. The world needs more dog stories. Johnny McConnors, Luke, Kansas. Sean, I just met a cousin that I never knew that I had. And we met, of all places, in a bar in Joplin, Missouri. I thought she was kind of cute, and I was going to hit on her, and she's about my age. I saw her sitting listening to the band, listening to them play, and I noticed this guy that she was with, when he got up to go to the bathroom, I thought to myself, now's my chance to make her notice me. And I realized that long, long ago, we used to go to church together. And then I felt kind of bad about trying to make a pass on her. We started talking, and the more we started talking, the more I realized how familiar she seemed. And it turns out we share a lot of the same kinfolk. And now, this morning, I just figured out through talking to my mother on the phone that we are second cousins. And I feel very, very badly about my intentions. (laughs) Anyway, I know this sounds weird. I know this might be something you might not want to read on your show, but it made me feel so connected, actually, to know that she was my cousin. A connection to this big world. You never know where you'll find family. Just don't try to make the moves on your family. (laughs) Danny Wilmers, Athens, Georgia. Hi, Sean. My mother's almost 80 years old tomorrow. 80 years old. She's actually the one who introduced me to your show. So I just want to say... Anything my 80-year-old mother loves is good indeed. So keep up the good work from everybody here. Keep up the good work. Wish my mother a happy birthday if you can. Her name is Anna, but everybody calls her Sugar for short. Dear Sugar, from everybody here tonight, happy 80th birthday. (laughs) Happy 80th birthday, and may your kids rise to bless you and never give you anything that would cause unnecessary heartburn. Lonnie Robertson, San Diego, California. Sean, I've never been to the South, but your show makes me want to go try it out real bad. I'm in the process of booking our Christmas break vacation to tour all the sites in Alabama, including black history sites and sites from Selma, the Selma March. And then we're going to go to Tennessee, hopefully to get a taste of the mountains, and probably even go to Dollywood. Hopefully, we'll get to try some of those down-home biscuits you always talk about. Just wanted to let you know that you have a friend here in San Diego, and if I ever meet you, I guess we could call each other cousins. Your buddy or slash cousin, Lonnie. Dear Lonnie, from everybody here tonight, I think I can give you some pertinent advice Find a joint with muddy trucks in the parking lot, and I guarantee you your chances are nine to one that you will find the best deck on biscuits you have ever tasted in your life. And that's letters from our listeners. We're going to have another tweet here from the Quasi Brothers, everybody. The Quasi Brothers. Told each 
little bird, every little single word that you said is worthwhile. Yes, I told them all about you. I told the moon, every little star that shines above, about the way you roll your pretty eyes and how you love. Each little honeybee knows it's going to be a honeymoon for two. Yes, I told them. Autumn day, a lovely autumn day. It was the kind of day that makes you just makes you just feel like your heart's been broken. It's a beautiful time of year when the glory of summer starts to fade and the beauty of autumn starts to to rise. Of course, nothing is really rising. The dew is is receding from the trees, which begin to lose their color. I was in Birmingham last week for a show, and Birmingham seems to have somewhat of a season. Whereas where I live in northwest Florida, where my mother lives in Black Creek, Florida, you don't get much of a season at all. You get trees which barely change color. The longleaf pines go from being a a rich green to kind of a a lime puke green. (laughs) There's not much to be said for fall in our part of the world. But in Birmingham, you almost have the semblance of fall. You have trees which change color. A week before I was in Gunnersville, Alabama, and fall was beginning to take over the world, beginning of October, I went all around and looked at the small trails which surround Lake Gunnersville, Alabama. Lake Gunnersville, Alabama is where God did some of his best work. <laughs> on the Sand Mountain region where there's a holiness church on just about every street corner where women wear 10-foot-tall beehive hairdos. And during the summer times, they go to the public pool dressed in long denim dresses, and they will jump in that public pool in those long denim dresses and go swimming. I've seen it done. My cousin Ed Lee and I went to a church once on Sand Mountain. It was the kind of church that had ushers that carried these large aquariums from the back of the church all the way to the front of the church, and they set them on the altar of God. And they had these reptiles inside, snakes, And I watched an old woman walk to the front of the church and she lifted a snake up out of that aquarium and held it toward the light and said, I have faith, I have faith. My cousin Ed Lee had been coaxed by one of the ushers to get up there and hold one of them snakes. And just as he got that snake above his head, he closed his eyes and he smiled like like the Holy Spirit was taking him over. And that's when one of them snakes opened up his mouth and bared his fangs. And that snake came down on his arm and it popped him. He flung that snake into the air and he screamed a four-letter word beginning with the 19th letter of the alphabet. (laughs) He walked outside and he was panting heavy and breathing. 
This old lady came out. She rested her hand on him. She said, do you believe that God can hear you? He said, I don't know. She said, well, you better. Because all them snakes in that aquarium in there had been defined. <laughs> and that was the last time we ever visited a Pentecostal church. <laughs> Cousin Ed Lee and I. Lake Gunnersville is a beautiful place, and you can see the colors of fall take over that place. It's beautiful. Oh, it's beautiful. I was walking around a grocery store up there. I saw a man who was clearly a holiness man. You can tell holiness people, they grow their hair in different ways. The women grow their hair at 10 foot tall. And the men, they let their hair grow a little bit longer than normal. Not much longer, but just a little bit longer so that it has a little bit of height to it. They get that thing way up in the air because the higher your hair, the closer you are to God. I saw this man wandering the rows of the supermarket, and he was rolling down that aisle, and his son was sitting in the front of his cart just screaming his guts out. And that man was saying, oh, George, oh, George, just be patient. Just, just be patient and hold yourself together, little George. And when he passed me, I said, you know, I have to commend you. I have to commend you for being so patient and kind-hearted to little George. He said, buddy, my name is George. (laughs) Yes, sir. Autumn is a beautiful time of year. I love it. I love it. It was an autumn season when my father would stand in his shed with his friends and they would drink Dixie beer. Dixie beer was brewed in New Orleans starting in 1907. It's a wonderful beer in a green bottle that tastes a whole lot like cat urine. (laughs) But he would drink it and he asked me if I wanted a, a taste one day and I took a drink and all his friends were looking at me to see my first entrance into manhood. I took a sip and I And I gagged almost. I said, it tastes terrible, Daddy. He said, I know it, but one day that cat urine's going to taste awful good to you. (laughs) Awful good. Autumn season is the time when my mother would go in to town and she would get new clothes. My mother was a seamstress. She knew how to make things. She always had a little baggie that she'd sent away for a mail order and they were tags that she would sew onto our garments. They had our last name on the back. It said Dietrich. There were some tags with my name, some tags with her name, some tags with my father's name. My father always had a tag with his name in it for everything that he owned, his, his welding jacket, his welding overalls, his wearing welding jeans, even his welding helmet. My mother would sew our names into everything we owned, all of my underpants, had my name sewed into the tag. Sean Dietrich was sewed right in there in case I ever forgot who I was one morning when I was putting on my tidy whities Once a year, around autumn time, my mother would go into town and they just built a shopping mall. A shopping mall right in town. It was a tall, two levels, and it was wide. It had handicapped parking up front. Nowhere we ever went to buy groceries or items or to buy, to buy jeans for, her fa- for my father. My father was so skinny, his jeans only had one back pocket on them. He had to run around in the shower just to get wet. <laughs> and if it worked for his Adam's apple, he'd have no shape at all. took us into that mall. They just built it. It was larger than anything I'd ever seen, like four football stadiums pressed together. I'd never seen a place this big. It had an atrium right in the center, and they said right there in that atrium was a food court. My mother drove us into town in her blazer. She kicked open that door, and we walked through this long parking lot toward the shopping mall. It was incredible. We walked through these sliding doors. We walked around this shopping mall. They had all sorts of stores. They had stores that sell that sell candles of every scent and flavor you could ever imagine. The reason I, I stopped in this store was because it smelled like a big old pumpkin pie. But it was not pumpkin pie. It was just a candle called pumpkin pie. I'd never heard of such in all my life. 
It was the most wonderful thing I'd ever smelled. I, I took that candle. It was called a Yankee candle. And I sniffed it. I, I pulled that sniff into my lungs. And while I was in that candle store, I somehow got detached from my mother. I'd wandered off. And I lost track of her. I walked out of that store and I was dizzy from all the scents of candles I'd been smelling. And she was gone. And I was terrified. I didn't know where she was. There were people walking by me of every shape, size, and denomination. I could tell just simply by the way some of these people were walking. They were not Southern Baptist because they had rhythm in their step. And Southern Baptists do not have rhythm. We were the kind of people who did not believe in premarital relations because it might lead to dancing. (laughs) You can watch me walk across the room and you know. You know I was raised Southern Baptist because I have a little hitch in my get along. I have a stiffness to my gait. It looks like I have what my father would say, a corn cob wedged in an orifice of my body. That I shall not mention. I stood in the midst of these people and I started to sweat. My palms started to sweat. My forehead started to sweat. And I felt like I was losing all my color, much like the leaves do during the autumn season. I was terrified. And I called out. I said, Mama, Mama. But I couldn't find her. And I looked at the sign above that storefront that I was looking at, Yankee Candle Company. I knew the demise of my life would be because of a Yankee. I knew it. Ever since my father had been walking along one day, ever since he'd seen a man standing on the ledge in a big city, the ledge just outside Spring Hill, Tennessee, the man was standing there and he was about to jump. And my father said, don't do it. Don't do it. He said, give me one reason why. And my father said, because of your mother. Don't do it because of your mother. He said, I ain't got no mother. My father said, well, don't do it because of your father. He said, I ain't got no father. He said, well, don't do it because of Dale Earnhardt. The man said, who's Dale Earnhardt? My father said, you know what? Just go ahead and jump, you Yankee. (laughs) I started walking along this shopping mall and took my chances. I looked around. I saw nothing of familiarity. I saw stores that advertised earrings, not for women, but for men. A man was standing out front. He had piercings in his nose and piercings in his ears. He wore jeans that were not blue, but white colored with little flecks of dark on them. And they had holes on the knees. He had an earring wedged in his nose it, with a chain strung from that ring in his nose going to his ear. I stopped and I asked him why he had pierced his nose. He said, because it's cool, son. It's cool. Would you like me to pierce your ear? And I walked t- two steps backward from him and I bumped right into a man who was wearing pure leather from head to toe. His hair was greased to his head, and he had a duck tail coming down over his forehead. He had snakeskin boots on and a chain going from his pocket to his wallet. He said, watch where you're going, son. And I I was very scared. I'd never seen this many people in one place before. I kept on walking, and I walked on a little further. And there was a place that sold perfume. There were smells inside this store that were terrifying because they were not what I was used to. I was used to my mother's perfume, which was Estee Lauder's youth (laughs) dew. I kept on walking and I passed Macy's department store. I'd never been to a Macy's before in all my life. There was a man in that store. He was playing the piano. He had claw hammer coattails coming off his tuxedo. He was playing Rhapsody in Blue. He was playing songs by George Gershwin. He said, it's customary to tip, tip the piano player's son. I said, I ain't got nothing but a quarter. He said, a quarter will do. And I threw a quarter in his jar. And he played something for me from a composer he said was from France called Sasson. He played 
Carnival of the Animals, the Swan. Oh, you should have heard him play it. It was beautiful. It drew a small crowd of people around him. There was a man in this crowd. He stood there. He had a corduroy jacket on with, with patches on his sleeves. And he clapped a few times. And the man reached into his coat pocket and retrieved two dollar bills. And he threw them into the man's jar. He said, can you play something from the Cokesbury hymnal? And the man with a claw hammer tuxedo jacket on said, sure I can. Sure I can. And he played Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nations. There was a gentle applause that that man received. And the man in the corduroy jacket, who was standing next to me, he looked about seven foot tall. He had shoulders longer than a long horn steer. He had faded blue jeans on. He looked like the kind of men that my father used to have fun with in his shed when they'd hold long neck bottles of Dixie beer, sweaty bottles, and they would tell outrageously untrue stories. And sometimes my father would ask me to tell a story because my father had taught me two or three good stories to tell. One of the jokes my father would have me tell for his friends in that shed would be the joke about the Southern Baptist preacher who did not believe in Halloween. He believed Halloween during the autumn was a, was a raucous holiday that was, was sinful, where men and women would encourage their children to dress up like horrible creatures. He thought it was terrible and lascivious. And yet, one night, on Halloween night, he was coming home from a prayer meeting, and his wife had decided to give him a scare. She went to the store, and she bought one of the masks that the young was wearing. It was a terrible mask of Frankenstein, a, a horrible mask. And she hid in the bushes, and when he was coming up the sidewalk, she waited for him. And just at the last moment, she jumped out, and she scared the living but Jesus out of him, and she said, Boo, I'm the devil. And that Southern Baptist man just held out his hand unmoved and he said, I'd like to shake your hand because I'm married to your sister. <laughs> this man played the piano in the mall. He was good. He played, there's room at the cross for you. He played, what a fellowship, what a joy divine leaning on the everlasting arms. And the man in the corduroy blazer, he just clapped very softly for the man playing the piano. And so did I. The man in the corduroy jacket looked at me. He said, say, you look familiar. He said, are you lost? I said, I don't think so. My parents had taught me to be very, very wary of strangers because when you grow up in a place that's very small, you learn how not to trust people who don't look like you do. But this man looked a whole lot like the men my father came from, the men I came from. He said, you look lost. He said, where's your mama or your daddy? I could feel my face start to break. I said, I am lost. I don't know where I am. He said, well, I can can help, I think. And he held out his hand. He said, it's okay. It's okay. Let's go find your mama. And I was very wary. I was very wary. I didn't know what to do. I said, I'd prefer not to hold your hand, sir. He said, that's okay, that's okay. I put my hands in my pockets and I stayed at least four feet away from this man. And we walked through that shopping mall together, me and this man. We walked all through all sorts of stores. We passed all sorts of people. And I let people walk between us because I was too afraid to stand close to him because I did not know him. I did not trust him. People from small places are distrustful. But I followed him. We walked past the J.C. Penney, and we stopped, and we looked at the mannequins in the window. He said, what kinds of fashions will they come up with next? He said, do you know that in my mother's day, they wore dresses that came all the way down to your ankle? 
He said, nowadays, the way things that come up above the knee, what's this one coming to? We kept on walking. We walked a little further. We passed that Yankee candle store again. He said, my God, it smells like a bakery in there. I said, don't go in there. It's just a bunch of Yankees who don't know who Dale Earnhardt is. <laughs> we kept on walking. and We walked into Saks Fifth Avenue. I'd never been to a store like this before. I didn't know where Fifth Avenue was and why you need a sack when you was going there. We walked through the women's department. It was the women's lingerie department. Saw a girl. She was trying on this dress that was a take-apart dress. And there was a woman, and there, she was with her daughter, a shapely young woman. And there was a sales lady who was with them. And she said, would you, if you take off this bolero, the frills of this dress, it leaves you with a sun suit. And I could see this girl's legs. She had legs clipped to her neck. And I was, I was stopped with, with surprise. I'd never seen that much skin before. And the sales lady unzipped something. She said, if you take off this part of the dress, it would leave you with a bathing suit. And the man with the corduroy said, Lord, I hope she don't take off anymore because it will leave her with a lawsuit. Kept on walking through the fragrance section of Saks Fifth Avenue, and we walked through the women's clothing section and the women's lingerie section. I kept my eyes closed, walked through the male clothing section where they had the cheap neckties and the cheap jeans that my father said were the kind of jeans would fall apart if you ever put them on. My father only bought jeans from a store where you could buy welding jackets and leather gloves and and pieces of rope that you could use on the job site. He did not buy designer jeans. And we finally got to a place where I saw my mother and she was talking to a man in pressed blue clothes with a badge on and she was crying. She was crying. I'd never seen her cry like that before. Her face was covered in tears. Her cheeks were plum red. And the man who stood in the distance, he said, I believe that's your mom, isn't it? He said, well, I think you got it from here. And he winked at me. And I just looked at my mother talking to that man with the badge on. And I walked toward her, and I realized as I stopped just by, just by a mannequin display that that man had guided me across a busy, busy place, a sea of people who I did not know all the way to my mama. And I turned back to thank him. And when I turned back, he was gone. I walked toward my mother and she, she caught a glimpse of me. She had no shopping bags in her hand. She had nothing but her purse. She dropped it and she ran toward me crying and she said my name and she threw her arms around me and I threw my arms around her and for an unexplained reason I started crying too. She said, oh, my God, oh, my God, I was so worried. Don't ever scare me like that again. Don't ever scare me like that again. We went into that candle shop, and I couldn't find you. I said, oh, Mama, I was off smelling the pumpkin pie candle. We walked across that busy shopping mall, and she said, would you like some ice cream? We walked into this ice cream shop, and I got chocolate and vanilla ice cream which were combined together in a swirl placed onto a small cone and I licked it for all it was worth my mother said would you like another one she was just so glad to have me I said yes I would ma'am I went up to that counter I got me a, a chocolate and vanilla ice cream swirl again and after I finished that she said how about some how about some food? How about a hamburger or some chili cheese fries? I said, yeah, I could eat. And I went up there and I got a chili cheese fry and a burger. And I ate it with my mother. And we walked to our blazer out there in the parking lot that beautiful autumn day. My mother said, oh, don't ever leave me like that again. Don't ever leave me like that again. And I thought to myself, as I was so full of ice cream, chili cheese fries and hamburgers and chili cheese fries was awful good maybe I better get lost 
a little more often. Hey, thanks for listening to me, folks, tonight. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks for listening to Sean of the South. I've been your host today, Sean Dietrich, and it has been a bona fide pleasure, if I do say so myself. Hope you join us next week, maybe even the week after that, if you ain't got nothing going on. That music you heard behind me today was the Quasi Brothers, Jesse and Steve from Kansas City. Since Jesse moved to KC in 2013, they've been playing nearly every Tuesday evening, learning new and old songs on a combination of the fiddle, banjo, guitar, mandolin, and any other stringed instrument you can think of. These guys aren't just good. They're beautiful. Check out their music on iTunes, Amazon, or CD Baby, or look them up on Facebook, and you won't be sorry that you did. To find anything more about what I do, you can visit SeanOfTheSouthShow.com. And while you're there, I hope you take the time to check out our archives. You can find every episode starting from the very first one to this current episode you just heard. Also, I hope you take the time to drop us a line, because I love to hear from my friends. Tell me about your birthday announcements, grandparents' anniversaries, church socials, ice cream potlucks, doesn't matter. And I'll do my best to read them over the air. If I am so inclined, because I love to do that sort of stuff for my friends. And speaking of friends, friends, wherever you go, there you are. And wherever you are, there you have gone. Adios. <laughs>